Thank you, Pastor Bill, and good morning, everyone. Good morning. Morning. Uh, this is the day the Lord hath made, Amen. and I will rejoice and be glad in it. It's a wonderful privilege to be here, and I thank you for your continued support and prayer for Rosalie and I. And uh, I've just come back from the Philippines. Previous to that, uh, Sri Lanka and India. Tomorrow I leave for Fiji. So uh, wonderful to serve the Lord and to be able to share with you from God's Word this morning. Now, I believe you've been taking the subject or the series on the seven churches of uh, the book of Revelation, and I wanted to try and share with you some of my reflections and thoughts <clears throat> that I trust will be helpful for you as a church. Um, I'm glad to hear that you're making month of May a month of gratitude, but uh, really we should be grateful every day. You know, that wonderful thing, he took me out of a horrible pit and placed my feet upon a rock and put a new song in my heart, even praise unto the Lord. And uh, I'm forever grateful. I was saved in November 1958. And forever am I thankful to God for life and health and strength and uh, for the wonderful privilege of serving him in whatever way I can. So I'm happy to be here with you today. I know that you share those same thoughts. And today I would like us just to turn to the scriptures uh, in a moment and read just the passage that I will be referring to uh, this morning. What I would particularly like to do in respect to how I will uh, present the message that Jesus gave to the church in Laodicea is I want to see the essence of his message, the nature of what he had to say, and how we can strengthen the church today. Those things that we need to be aware of and to guard in respect to not allowing that uh, essence of the message of lukewarmness to gain a hold within our own lives personally, because our message, as it was in Jesus' day, he gave this message in respect to first on a personal basis, and then secondly, corporately, because the church is not a building, it's you and me, it's people. And we never should lose sight of that, that the messages that he gave to the church have a very, very personal application to our own lives. I would like us to look at his message and then see how we can learn from it and apply some of those things that would guard against such lukewarmness or insipid attitudes that can so easily creep in to the life of ourselves and our church. Let's read Revelation 3, verses 13 to 22. <clears throat> he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, Right, these are the words of the Amen and faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold or hot. I wish that you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say... I am rich, and I have acquired wealth, and I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold, refined in the fire, 
so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve or ointment to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, stand, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Now, I know traditionally there are ways in which we could deal with this passage of Scripture, the seven churches of Asia did exist. There were physical churches. They existed somewhere in the region of Turkey or what we know as Turkey today. Uh, there also is a prophetic aspect of these that they relate to seven periods of the church history, beginning from its inception on the day of Pentecost through to the end time when Jesus would return and the church would be taken up to be with God. That aspect of it, of course, has with it some very important things to learn. But it's not the aspect that I want to take today so much because it's very easy for us to say, well, now we're living in the last days and the church is like this. I have a lot of people that I meet who have a lot of complaining about the church but not a great lot of solution how to uh, address these matters. So today it is more important for me and for you, and I want to say this, I'm here for you today. I'm not here just to give a nice message. I want to see how we could all group together, hold hands together, and how we could learn from this message that Jesus gave to the church in Laodicea, and then see how we can implement those things which would continue to keep our hearts hot for Jesus. I'd like to read a scripture to you from Psalm 39, if I may, and uh, verse 3. My heart was hot within me while I was musing or meditating. The fire burned, then spoke I with my tongue. I, you know, God, God's purpose for us is that our hearts would be hot with a passion for Jesus. The thing is here that as he began to meditate and as he began to reflect upon all of the things that God had done and what he was and what he is, something took part or took place in the heart. He says that as I mused upon it, my emotions were inflamed. They were put on a, a hot plate, as it were. It, it, it was like there's something took place on the inside. And then he says this, this whole thing about a hot heart leads to what you speak. So, you know, like it affects our prayer life, the way we pray and what we pray for. It affects our Ability to speak passionately about the lover of our soul. It has to do with how we're able to talk not only to God, but to the world and to the nations. You see, this hot heart business is what Jesus was rejecting. He said, this is what I dislike. I, I, I want to get spew this out. I, I'm, I'm rejecting it. I can't handle this lukewarmness. And so the message of the Laodicean church was that it was tepid. It was lukewarm. It was neither hot nor cold. It, it, it had indifference, neutrality, and passivity. It was very passive. 
One of the things also I see is that it lacked courage and faith to stand up for God. In my journey over the years and the many places I have to go to, it's interesting to what you see. But I note there are those heroes, both men and women, who stand up for truth. They're not prepared to be neutral in the work that I do, and I see so much injustice. What do you do with injustice? You walk away with it, untouched, unmoved? What happens on the inside of us? You see, this church that Jesus was speaking to lacked the courage and faith to stand up for God and it was so easy to compromise. Yet they didn't even have the courage to say, I don't believe in God. I won't obey him. You see, it, they were not... Anyway, a little bit like... Jesus described Peter before his conversion. He said, like you're a reed, easily blown, this way or that. We need to learn from the message that Jesus gave to the church here in Laodicea. I'm not prepared to include every church in today's world to be like the Laodicean church. That would be unfair and unjust and not right because there are many who are very passionate for Christ. But what is this message trying to tell us? What is it that we should be diligent about in today's world? What are the dangers that we should be aware of and endeavor to seek to address. You see, we can often see the fault or the failure or the weakness, but we must also have a solution. There must be a remedy. There must be something we can do about it. Just to see injustice and move by on this side or that side, like the man in the story of the Good Samaritan and those who pass by on the other side. That is sad. And one question we need to ask ourselves today is, is it possible that we today could fall into a similar state as that of the Laodicean church? Well, the answer is, it's possible. The man that standeth should take heed, lest he fall. That's what Paul's advice and counsel to the Corinthian church was. Pretty sad indictment that Jesus would speak of his own church in this way. And he says, I know your deeds, your behavior, your lifestyle. You are neither hot or cold. And I wish that you were one or the other. Well, that statement means that your state and your condition is not acceptable to me. So we're pretty clear about that. And because you are like this, I reject you. You will no longer be a part of me. They were lukewarm, tepid, half-hearted, indifferent, unenthusiastic, unexcited. They were lacking in conviction. I'm amazed at people who, who don't have an opinion. Seriously. You know, not to make a decision is a decision not to do anything. We don't realize that. Lacking conviction. Okay. I, I, I trust that my wife and I's life would leave it some message behind and say, well, they were convinced about something. Yes. I mean, what do you see about my life? What is it? 
Shall I be like David's son who built this tower so he could be remembered? Absalom? Well, what do we remember Absalom for? Not the tower. For something else. They were not valiant for truth upon the earth. I, I read the scripture just recently, Jeremiah 9, verse 3. And they bend their tongues like their bow for lies, but they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. I thank God for Pastor Bill. He's very valiant about some things in respect to those moral issues that he is campaigning for. This church, Laodicea, it, it, it was lukewarm in faith. You know, some people say they have faith, but there's no works. They were lacking in courage to either follow God or rebel against him. I don't mind meeting people who say they don't believe in God. I was just telling Pastor Bill a few moments ago, I was in Sri Lanka holding a, not holding, I was asked to speak at a healing service on a Wednesday night and there was probably 500 people there and all I spoke was for 10, 15 minutes on forgiveness and the joy and the release of having your sins forgiven. I spoke about my salvation. And I saw over 60 people come forward to receive Christ for the first time. These were Hindus and, 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 and Buddhists and, 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 and people who didn't believe in God. Now, you, you don't, don't put that down to me. This is something God does, you know. But you have to be valiant for the truth. You've got to be, have some conviction, some courage. And what I see in the lukewarmness of the Laodicean church was there's very little passion for Christ as a person, as the central factor of their relationship. And I want to spend a little bit of time on that. Who is the most important person in your life? Now, not just what you say today, I mean tomorrow, in the midst of trial, in the midst of tribulation, when everything's going wrong, but what about all the happy clappy times, all the times of celebration, and you've got revival? Who's, who, who now is the principal? Oh, it's Pastor Barry. He's got the anointing. He's an apostle now. Good Lord. Wake <laughs> up. Wake up. The thing is, how can you practice making him the central figure of your life on a daily basis? And many times daily of your life and my life. I know your deeds, your lifestyle. Come on now. We invite God to help us when we've got all the big problems. How many times do we say, oh, gee, I love you, Lord. Our busyness so crowds out our opportunity to practice Today, it's more about worship of him without a deep reverence to obey him. You'd be surprised how many people are carrying hurts and unforgiveness month after month, year after year. That's not obedience. The relationship doesn't change, but our fellowship does depending on our responses. If you live in me and my words live in you, see, that's, that's the deal that Jesus spoke about. There is a certain level of respect and honour for Jesus, but it's not, there's not the equal commitment to completely surrender and give him all areas of our lives. 
They were lukewarm in respect to compassion for the lost sinner. And so sadly today I see many times the church is more engaged in activities and caring for the church congregation. You know, the, the story that Jesus gave of the parable, you leave the 90 and 9, they won't die, they won't suffer, they may not have the best deal while you're away, but they won't die, they'll survive and go after the lost one. I'd like to just mention briefly in our journey this morning about a lesson from history. It was this chilly spiritual atmosphere that, that the church produced or that the church had at the time of John Wesley. The Methodist Church and then later on William Booth, the Salvation Army. It was the chilly spiritual atmosphere of the Church of England that drove John Wesley to start those outside meetings which became so noted for their religious fervor. But sadly, something happened. In regards to William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, it was the same chilly atmosphere of the Methodist Church that drove William Booth to turn to become a red-hot salvationist. So you see what happens in some generations of the church. The sad thing about this message that Jesus gave to the church was the self-deception of the church of Laodicea. His message to them was so different to what they expected. They actually thought they were spiritually okay. They could not see their true spiritual condition. They were deceived. How deceived and blind they had become. And this is what happens when lukewarmness creeps in. They were wretched. Miserable, pitiful, poor. The actual meaning of that is they were kind of practicing begging, not in the real sense. And they were blind, naked, unclothed. <clears throat> Need to be careful that the church doesn't just become socially orientated so that eventually it becomes mechanical. One of the struggles that I have in the work that I do is in all of the humanitarian and mercy ministries that are so prevalent today is somehow have forgotten the presentation, the proclamation with words, with words, with words of the gospel. This is not the gospel of love. This is the gospel of salvation. Somebody who died. This purpose came I into the world, Jesus said. So you see, it is so easy to make this shift without us actually knowing. There's a danger of the absence of spiritual heat. And so we must guard against these happening to us today. Sad thing about all of this is at the end of this chapter, Jesus is outside the Laodicean church seeking an entry. Don't you think that's tragic? Now, if we were to take that personally, what kind of access does Jesus have to our heart on a regular basis? I don't know how many people, and I'm not being critical here. I'm trying to help people when I pray for them. I've just come out of the Philippines ministering with leaders there. And some of those young people 
have just come to Christ, and, but they've never had a real encounter with Jesus Christ themselves. They don't know how. To. They say, I pray, but nothing happens. I go to church, and I, I don't, nothing happens to me. Now, that's not the fault of the church. But here are people who are seeking for Jesus to have access to them. And they don't know how to give him access. And one wonders the tragedy of this, that Jesus, who is supposed to be the central factor, the central person of the church, is outside seeking entry in. The question we need to ask every one of us today, and not just today, but on a regular basis, does Jesus have access to us? Huh? Draw me, we will run after thee. Sometimes we don't want to pray that kind of prayer as it's prayed in the book of songs where the bride says to the bridegroom, draw me, we will run after you. We want to know where, we want to know how, we want to know who. See, we haven't practised allowing Jesus to have access to us. And what, what a sad thing. Never mind about the church, you know, because the church are you and I. What is my response to this person who loved me and gave his life for me? Uh, is, is he outside certain areas of our lives that we have not allowed him to address or have entry to? What would he say if I hate or retaliate or I'm unforgiving or I'm disobedient or I'm unwilling? We put this all down to human nature and say, oh, well, I'm just like that. Well, I'm a recluse. I'm, I'm a secret person. I'm a quiet... What, what is all this? This is just terminologies that really reflect the fact that sadly he's seeking. The fact is he's still knocking. What about some of the issues in my life that I haven't wanted to face? But ultimately, I've had. I've heard the knocking. Somebody only has to get up and say something, a little boy or a girl or a preacher, and I'm awakened again to the fact that I haven't allowed access into my heart on that issue. Wow. You say, you're making this a big deal. No, not a big deal at all. It's just our stubbornness, sometimes our ignorance. You know, I took a, a very famous preacher to a little village in Papua New Guinea. When he came out of that service, he said, this is the first place in all the world that I've ever preached where the people don't want anything more than what they've got. How tragic. How tragic it is when we say, I'm okay. That's what the Laodicean church said you see Jesus is outside he's not the central figure of our of the content of our preaching and our presentation of Christ the cross Christ's cross is often forgotten in Genesis 22 verse 7 this has had a powerful effect upon me Abraham and Isaac going up to Mount Moriah to offer Isaac his son on the altar. And they're going up with the donkey. And Isaac says to his son, Isaac says to his father, See, father, here is the wood and the fire, but where is the offering for the burnt sacrifice? And all I can say is we need to understand the content of our presentation of Christ must include the central factor of the burnt offering which reflects or typifies the cross of him dying there for us. 
when we lose sight. You know, some people are so wonderfully caught up with the wood and the fire. And I won't tell you what I think they are equated with. Answer of Abraham was, God shall provide for himself an offering. See, God provided this lamb that takes away the sin of the world. The centrality of Christ, the centrality of the cross, the centrality of Christ in our relationship on a personal basis. Why do I serve? I don't serve for the movement. I don't serve for the denomination. I don't serve for mum and dad and sister and brother and uncle and cousin. I don't serve uh, to get a claim. Or I, This is a personal thing between me and Jesus. It's none of your business. Get your own. Seriously, that's how I see what Jesus is and should be to each one of us. I'll finish this morning by saying to you, I'm not very artistic. That's pretty obvious. <clears throat> Don't have a lot of that creative cultural instinct in me in the sense of being able to do it so nicely that some of you do it. So that's why I like the book of Song of Songs because there's a language of love in there that helps me to express myself. I actually plagiarise, I actually steal the words of that lady that express her love for Jesus. That's kind of neat for me because this is about me and him and nobody else in between. Whatever I do, my worship, my service, my praise, my giving, my sacrifice, whatever it is. And I want to say this and honour my dear wife. She's the same. I remember when I first was, <coughs> we were courting and we were going to get him married and I uh, remember I said, oh, well, let's stay home from church today. And she says, no way, you can stay home, but I'm going. And, you know, I thought, well, that's pretty rotten, you know. That's, that's bad. She loves God more than me. <laughs> that's what she's like. See, this business, the reason that I have such a wonderful wife and friend is because of her relationship to the Lord. This is not doing this for Pastor Barry or a husband or a friend. And I just want to say to you, these are the kind of things that we need to guard in our lives and make sure that our church, you, as a person, are seeking to establish that this relationship between you and Jesus is a hot one. Because uh, if your heart's on fire, the mouth will speak. You know, the mouth will speak. What does it speak? Oh, criticism, cynicism, complaining. It's a year of gratitude every year, every day. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me.